Jackson. My name is Dr. Jawanda Rollins Stokes. I was born and raised here in Caroline County, left and went to Hampton University. Um, I have my degree in a double major of psychology and education with a counseling strand. Um, I stayed on for the fifth year to get my master's in teaching and decided to come back to Caroline County to give back to the community. I got a lot of scholarship money from community service. And so I know the, the shoulders on which I was standing to be able to accomplish the things that I did. And it was just a passion of mine to come back home. Um, so I taught here in the county for 15 years. While here, um, I taught third and fourth grade. Um, and I always sought out leadership positions and um, looking at the children that I was serving and the families and the issues that I was seeing in the community and always trying to think outside of the box as to you know, how else can I contribute. Um, fast forward, um, I did earn my uh, national board certification while teaching here. Our students earned me that credential. Um, and so it really took a village. Um, so I know what our students are able to do and they are top notch. Yes. Um, so fast forward a few more years and I went back and I got my doctorate degree in curriculum and instruction and then um, ran for school board. And in serving on school board, you cannot teach. And so I transitioned, shift gears a little bit and I now am a senior consultant in the business sector um, where I work on multi-billion dollar transportation projects. So if you've gone up uh, 395 where they're expanding the toll roads, sorry, that's one of our projects. <laughs> I know some people, I know some people. <laughs> I'll blame that on them. And my uh, other big project is the Hampton Roads uh, Bridge Tunnel. So they'll be expanding that so you'll see a lot of construction coming that way. And what I do um, in that role is work with business owners, small businesses, and um, any project like that that has federal money on it, there um, are goals for DBE and SWAM, so disadvantaged businesses or small women and minority. And I help to make sure that they are prepared, certified, ready, and able to be able to work on these billion dollar projects. And so I have just found in that role that my background in education has served me well. Um, dealing with people <laughs> has served me well. Um, and in addition to um, helping the businesses get ready, I also work um, closely with workforce development. So being in the streets and finding folks who are underemployed um, and helping get them training and again, certified to be able to work on the projects. And so all of that is what I do on the daily. But there's something in the foundation that I encountered back in 2003 that absolutely changed my mindset and has had a lasting impact. And that is the work that I'm gonna share with you today. Um, some of you are familiar with it. Um, it's the work of Dr. Ruby Payne. Um, she did her dissertation, much like I did, and her topic was a framework for understanding poverty. And she found that it was very impactful. And so she took her study and she wrote a book. And she started selling those books. And when you do that, you need to set up some type of business structure because you're making money. And thus, um, aha, aha, like, mm, oh, aha. Aha Process is the name of her company. Um, and I haven't had a chance to share this with um, Ms. Wendy and Ms. Upshaw, but um, as of January 1, I'm a national consultant with Ruby Payne. And so I'm just <laughs> going to think about that. So I'll have the chance to travel the country and share this work. So I'm going to jump right in and get to the meat of it because that's enough about me. But I do want to show you that what, I, what I'm going to talk to you guys about today is not only applicable for the classroom or for the community, it covers a lot of different areas. So let's start with the school system because um, I serve on the school board and so of course that's one of my number one passions. This is the original book, Framework for Understanding Poverty, and it was designed to teach teachers how to engage with students who come from an under-resourced background. And I know I'm preaching to the choir for at least two individuals in the room. Um, since then, as of this year, a new book came out. It's just a newer edition. And in here, she addressed some of the criticisms that she's faced with her work. And I'll talk about that. 
Um, so that's for schools. Um, this book is also for schools and it talks about what happens if you notice that a child is not organized. What are some strategies that you can use? So there's a chart in here. You, you kind of figure out what's going on with the child. You turn to the chart, you find it, and then it gives you the solution to, to do it. So I like it because it's a quick toolbox um, piece. One of the things that we'll talk about in uh, resources would be your emotional resources. And so this is a book that's out that talks about how much of yourself do you own. Um, and in education, we're doing a lot right now with trauma-informed care. And so this is designed to help guide people through dealing with that garbage can that you need to dump. And if you can imagine the, the garbage that adults have, and we have the life experiences and the capability to process that. Can you imagine what that's like to an eight-year-old or a six-year-old? So that's what this is focused on. And then, because we know that children come to school from homes, homes are in communities, and individuals in the communities often have needs or they work and they live and they play in the community, there's bridges out of poverty. And so this is designed for agencies and organizations. If you are interfacing, what do you and your staff need to be aware of? Um, this really gets into the meat of policies and procedures that sometimes are counteractive or counterintuitive to what um, is truly helpful. And then the last piece that I'll share um, are the getting ahead. So the Getting Ahead series actually works with individuals who are in poverty, who are trying to overcome barriers and get out of poverty. So this is actually used with citizens. So I say all that to say, the body of research is very robust. I'm very passionate about it. And I hope that what I share with you today will um, give you enough of an introduction that um, you can decide if it's worth having additional training. Um, my disclaimer is that this is normally a full day training at minimum. Um, and I'm gonna consolidate that into about 30 minutes. So we generally have about 10 action items that we discuss. And today I'm only gonna talk about two of them with you all, okay? Um, part of what comes with the training is this workbook. And that gives you a resource because it is a lot of information. So you wanna have something that you can reference back. And I'm gonna use this today to go over uh, the main points with you um, instead of using a power. When we talk about a framework for understanding poverty, what are some of the things that immediately come to mind? If I can get just three examples. First thought, top of head. Education. Education. Nutrition. Nutrition. Employment. Employment, very good. Opportunity. Opportunity, awesome, awesome. Do we think about race when we think about poverty? Sometimes. Do we think about? Sometimes. Sometimes? Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, it is a component that is part of the larger discussion. Mm -hmm. What about things like motivation mm -hmm. and the desire to do better? Right. That's a popular one. That's a popular one. What about the economic status, the job availability? Is that something that we talk about as well? Absolutely. And those are things that were not included in the original work. And that was the criticism. Because the lens that we look at this from is a cognitive approach. And I promise you, this is the only deep section of tonight, okay? So from a cognitive approach, what we're saying is that there are causes of poverty and they're highly politicized. Some people feel very strongly that if you were motivated and you got up in the morning and you made up your mind that you were gonna do something different, that you have different outcomes. Yes? Yes. yes. And there are those that would believe that, well, it's not so much about that, it's about the fact that jobs are just not available and people are not skilled. And what we say is, it's about that, yes. It's about the second point, yes. There is a race component, yes. And there is definitely an education component. 
So instead of getting bogged down into the political arguments where we can each have a strong opinion, we're taking it from the approach that uses this pyramid. And the pyramid really looks at the thinking. So when we talk about existing in poverty, if we look at the thinking that happens when you live in that type of environment, it transcends race. Yes. It transcends gender. Yes. And it even can transcend geological location. Although I will say it's important to note that third world poverty does not look like Caroline County poverty, right? Yes. True. True. But if you look at the thinking no matter where, there's some things that impact it, okay? So I have to lay the foundation so the rest of this will make sense. So what we say is that your thinking is impacted by the demands of your environment. Yes? yes. Would you agree? Okay. Can you say like two more sentences to explain what that means? Absolutely. My thinking is impacted by the demands of my environment. Absolutely. What does that mean? So if my electricity is off, the demands of my environment would say that I need to get home before the sun gets goes down mm. because I need to get the clothes out and things out while I can see. That demand of my environment has now shifted my thinking and my priorities mm -hmm. because of what's going on right here. Mm -hmm. It's cold outside. So now the demand with the change in the weather is maybe kerosene mm -hmm. wasn't a priority two weeks ago when we were enjoying 68 degree weather, but the demand of my environment now has impacted my thinking. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah, I didn't know what you meant at all. <laughs> Great question, <laughs> Great question. So, and I'm also a minister, so I like the call and response, so, um, so that's one. The second thing that impacts thinking are the relationships and knowledge that you have. Imagine how many people actually come through Caroline County breakdown and don't know who to call. Mm -hmm. Think of those who happen to know, oh, or there's a church, or have just have that awareness. How many people don't interact with churches? Mm -hmm. So they wouldn't know to knock, you know, on the door. So the second thing would be, again, the relationships and knowledge. The third thing that impacts thinking are the resources that you have available. And what we found, and what I found in the trainings is sometimes we're sensitive to the word poverty. And so I like to say resourced or under-resourced. Is that all right? Yes. So I will interchange that. So could we be in agreement that thinking in a pop impoverished situation would be impacted by the demands of your environment who you know and what you know, and the resources you have available. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, then let's move on to the next point. So we have this continuum, and I'm gonna use the continuum two times. The first is to talk about the spectrum of poverty, okay? So we have, at the top, you have your wealth. And in wealth, you have old money, and you have new money. Old money is about connections. New money, you have financial means, but you don't have the relationship to share. Coming on down the spectrum, you have middle class. And then at the end of the spectrum, you have poverty. But as this committee and other churches and groups and things that I'm involved in and things that you are involved in, what we need to be mindful of is that there's a difference between situational poverty and generational poverty. Mm -hmm. So I'll be transparent and use myself, for example, I have worked all my life, you know, after college, you know, get your job, get you, your needs come before your wants, you know, and if you have money for hair and nails and this, that, and third, you got money for gas and, and your light bill, that's just how I was raised. Who, who, who told you that? You know, my mom, she was a pretty awesome lady. Bless you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is my mom for this. <laughs> <laughs> Center. And so I'll tell you why she's here in just a bit. <laughs> but, but that's how I was raised. Um, you know, we grew up in a middle class home. I didn't know that I was, 
I was poor or I was, class, yeah, yeah, we had no concept of that. Children stayed in children's places. Mm -hmm. It wasn't my concern. But um, I say that to say, and I totally lost my whole train of thought. <laughs> you threw me off there. Situation um, of poverty situation. versus generation. Thank you. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, you know, having been raised like that, I encountered a situation where I had some health issues. Had to have emergency surgery, was out of work unexpectedly, and could not go back to work. What do you do? I have grown folk bills. I have a house with a mortgage. You know, I'm not renting, and I, I can't afford to lose my home. And, you know, I got a car, and I got a child in school, and I need lunch money on that account. And there's but so much Rob Peter to pay Paul. And I found myself in this place I had never been before. And I'll tell you, I had to learn where the cheap toilet paper is. I had to learn that on Sundays when there was a church program that had food, we were staying. And it was, don't miss the bus, because I don't have extra gas money to take you to school. And where I would normally pick you up, you now need to ride the activity bus, which comes down the street. That's the reality and the stress of the demands of the environment that mm -hmm. shifted for me that some people live in every day. Yeah. Under, do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Situational. When I show you the other resources, it was because I had other of the nine resources, I had others to rely upon to help me get back on my feet. Mm -hmm. It still took me some time, but I'll tell you what, it was a humbling experience. Mm -hmm. And I learned to really say, but for the grace of God, truly, truly, truly. Mm -hmm. And I learned to be a little bit slower to judge, especially in the classroom setting, when you see children come in and they have on $300 sneakers mm -hmm. and no paper and pencil. That's just the truth of it. Mm -hmm. you, you learn some things. Now, in situational poverty, if I had not been able to get myself back in a place of stability and let's just say heaven forbid I lost everything and my child then grew up in a situation like that that would be one generation when we start talking about generational poverty it's when we look at three generations that are in that situation or more mm -hmm. so what happens then is if I don't know if I am a child and I don't know what it's like to have stable um, lodging it's hard for me to then be able to really identify with some other conversations that my classmates may be having, for example. Um, for a lot of parents, it's that choice and that balance that they have to strike because there's, there is a, I'm gonna use the word pride, and pride does not have to be a negative thing. But we, and we say this in church, oh, I'm so glad I don't look like what I've been through, right? <laughs> yeah. And that comes to play, honest to goodness, it comes to play. So when we look at the spectrum, it's, it's important to understand old money versus new money and generational poverty versus situational poverty. Now, here's where I'm gonna fast forward because I have limited time. When we talk about the nine resources, here is what I thought just, ultimately change my entire perspective. Because sometimes it's a little disheartening when you work with individuals that have so many compounding issues. It's like one firecracker goes off, then another, then another. And it's okay, I have a job interview, but then the car breaks down, or I have a license, but it was suspended. <laughs> but I'm gonna drive because I gotta get to this interview and then I get pulled over and I have a ticket and it, uh, do you see what I'm saying? And I'm sure these stories are very familiar to you. And then you have families trying to juggle which is which. Unfortunately, there's not enough money to just fix everybody's problems and issues financially. And so what I want you to know is that there are other resources that we need to look at, okay? So the first being financial, and that's talking about having enough money to purchase goods and services. Social services in the room, and I think uh, 
you would probably agree that it happens and it should not. Where people are using their food stamps inappropriately. It becomes a bartering tool because they're using the resources they have to get what they need. Oh, <laughs> or what they want. Yes. And then they come to groups or and want assistance in a different type of way. And that is because financial resources are limited. Ugly truth, that's what I'll call it. The second resource is the emotional resource. So having the emotional stability to say, trouble won't last always. That in my mind, I don't have to go from one extreme to the next. We don't work in always and never and nothing and all the time that there is a center and there is balance. That is the emotional stability or the emotional resource. So sometimes when you're taking that phone call, sometimes all that person really needs is for somebody to hear. Not necessarily to interject, but to just be heard. You are pouring into that emotional bank account that is so needed. And guess what? That doesn't cost you a dime. It costs you some time. It is draining. Oh, that's why we have how much of yourself do you own? Yes. So you gotta put that mask on. So one of the things to address the emotional piece is building a relationship of mutual respect. Because mutual respect means that even though I need that emotional deposit from you, I am not disrespectful of your time and you know the kids are running around, it's dinner time, but I, I have you hostage and I need you to hear about my life's journey and struggle all five hours or however long I can keep you on the phone. Have building that mutual respect is how you keep that resource in balance. Okay, I was going to ask you that question. Yes. Pretty much. Yeah. So the thing about that that you want to build in the conversation is stamina. Giving, giving perseverance. Giving choices to consider. Because when we have choices to consider, it keeps us from being polarized. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So we have financial, we have emotional. The next one is mental. So when you're working with individuals, it's important to assess whether or not they actually have the cognitive ability to understand what you're saying yes. and can process it mm -hmm. and can make those choices. And so a key there is to ask them to repeat it back. Now we encounter this a lot in schools, uh, particularly with IP meetings. It's a lot of information. Emotionally, the resources drain. Sometimes parents feel guilty. Is it my fault? My child has a disability. Maybe it came from me. And because they have this emotional cloud, it also impacts their reasoning and their mental state. Mm -hmm. And sometimes there is a deficit there. Yeah. So it's something to be mindful of. And again, that doesn't involve money. That involves pausing and breaking things down. We like to say that if, if it's not written on at least a third grade level, it's too high. <laughs> So it's not the time for our SAT vocabulary and pomp and circumstance and navigating the world of agencies. What does this paperwork mean? What is this asking for? What are the steps? And so you see a lot of flyers that have bullet points or big graphics, um, things that are very intuitive. So that's how you build the mental capacity because that's how people navigate daily life. The fourth one, and I think I'll be preaching to the choir here, is the spiritual capacity. If that spirituality, and this is not saying that you have to believe a certain way or in a certain deity, but it is saying that if you have a belief, generally, and this is what the research tells us, that there is a purpose higher than you, then it tends to not have an individual feel like they're fated. Fate, F-A-T-E. This is my fate. I have no choice in this. This is just how it's gonna be. So when you're hearing comments like that, then you know that it's an, that emotional piece. And here is where as church members, we can start pouring into that spiritual aspect of the person, okay? The next one is the physical resource. 
And so I think you gave an example where there's somebody in a situation, high need, and we also see that part of the peripheral factors are there's some physical uh, disabilities there. So if you have um, trauma or something that's affecting your physical ability, it turns up in not being able to work. It turns up in not being able to offer any support at home. It turns into a spouse then with an additional workload that maybe would normally be shared. You have children who are then serving in an adult capacity and then they come into the schools and they have still have that I'm the adult hat on and then it becomes a problem when they need to really be in the child's role. That's my take on it. Been around a while, seen it. So those types of things have an impact. It also is important because you don't wanna be offering a resource that the person physically cannot do. If they cannot lift, then when we're delivering food boxes, you need to be able to take it in the house. You need to maybe be able to help put the um, materials where they belong. Um, the next one is support systems. So one of the big um, opportunities that I had um, was the ability to move overseas or to take a teaching position in Hawaii. You will love it. If you have not had a chance to go, just to see God's handiwork is amazing, absolutely amazing. But if I were to transplant and relocate, I have no support system there. So as you can see from the background that I gave you, I juggle, I'm a master juggler. Um, I, I try to be really good about my time management, but there are times when I physically can't be in two places. And that's what you're gonna notice with a lot of families that we serve as well. Who is picking up the children if mom can't get off from work or dad can't get off from work? What in the world happens when it's a snow day and it's gone from a delay to a cancellation? Oh, I had to figure that out for the first time because I worked for the school. So school was closed, I was at home. And now I need to be in Northern Virginia. Who, where are the resources? If you do not have a support system, it can cause instability. Transportation is a huge, huge issue in our county. It's rural, so where's the support system specifically with that? Um, with the support system, they are your backup resources that you need to have available to be successful. Uh, relationships and role models. One of the things that this research did was compare uh, literally one million data points with people all over the country who had moved out of poverty. And the question that was asked to them was, what made the difference? And the number one answer across one million points was one caring adult. So you're trying to tell me that one caring adult was the answer across a million data points as number one? <laughs> but here's the thing, and, it's, and I'm going to use that to lead into the next one. If I've never been to school, college, my parents have never been, I'm a first time grad, I don't know how to navigate FAFSA, uh, uh, you know, what, what's the paperwork? What do you mean? I want to be a nurse. What do you mean I have to apply to the School of Nursing? And this is what we encountered in Caroline's Promise in our mentoring program. We had kids, that, that was their passion. They had not taken any advanced math, any advanced science, not prepared, not because they didn't have the desire or the want to, they did not know how. Mm -hmm. They did not know how. So the relationship and role model is there to bridge and to build, bridge and build. And every one of us at some point in life you're gonna to have to, if you reevaluate, because I'm there now, I have great relationships, but for where I want to go and the impact that I wanna have nationally and globally, I need a new network. I need to build those bridging relationships. And if you are in a situation where you're under-sourced or under-resourced, 
the relationship is going to be key. Why? Because the seventh, excuse me, the eighth resource are the hidden rules. The hidden rules is what will get you in trouble every single time. And there are hidden rules in each of the different classes. And I have just a few minutes. I only have one more. So with your hidden rules, there are things like if you want to come to serve and get resources, but you don't want to go through social services, we then may tend to say, well, if you can't follow the rules, you don't get what you want. That's an ugly truth, right? But it's a hard truth. But that is what we say because there are processes and procedures in place for a reason. But if I don't know that, or I don't know that connection, you don't know what you don't know. So a large part of what we have to do, all of us as advocates, whether it's ministry or school or media or whatever, is we have to teach the hidden rules. And so in, in, a, in an environment of poverty, one of the greatest hidden rules that I can share with you all is that people, relationships, are the forms of currency. I know it's the ocean. So that means. You have a connection. I don't have the money to fix my vehicle, but I'm going to call, right? I do something for you, you do something for me. That is the nature of survival when the demands of your environment are constantly changing. And that's not for, that's not for anybody to judge. It is what it is. And what I have found nine times out of 10 in environments of poverty, what we find are people who are really good problem solvers. We may not like how the problem is solved, and it might not be legal, <laughs> but the problem is solved. It might create another problem, but in the immediate, because that's what happens in poverty. I can't plan long term, because I have to worry about right now. That's where we see the consequences. And then the last one is the formal register. Formal register is teaching the language of the system that you are trying to navigate. Plain and simple. So I know that if I'm going to, um, for example, be in a school system, the language that I need to navigate that is not turning in the parking lot on two wheels and coming in with my body language and planning to curse out everybody. It gets you nowhere. So what's the formal register to be able to address the situation? And sometimes we don't know the right questions to ask. And so when you are that first point of contact and the story that you get is, I need this, this, and this, or this is this, and this is what happened, we have to learn to ask some follow-up questions to get to the deeper issue. If we take the time to pause and talk, we will find that these nine resources, that's the work that we need to do in our community. That's the work. Yeah. Will this help three generations of poverty uh, the children who are in that situation? What we do is by working with the children, mm -hmm. we're actually educating the children and the parent. Mm -hmm. Because the child is then going home and now they have something different to share. We do uh, storyboarding with middle and high schoolers. So they have to put on there what their skills are, what their talents are, uh, what they're interested in, what kind of home do they want. You know, if you want a pool, put it on there. You know, what kind of car do you want to drive? Where do you want to see yourself five years from now? Where do you want your bank account to look like? Because we have to give them something beyond a now to work towards, especially with our athletes, because they can perform as long as it's that season. So if it's football season, I'm an AB student. As soon as that season is over, we're digressing into some other behavior. Why? Because that, that performance has been attached to this one thing. So like I said, there's a lot more to the training. It does have a nice colorful PowerPoint to be more engaging. There's some questions that, uh, you know, turn and talk to your neighbor and that sort of thing to really take a deep dive into what I just really glazed the surface on. But I hope that um, my quick talk with you tonight has helped you to see that the issues that 
we face in this community don't always have to have a huge hit on the budget, but they do need to be handled by individuals who are aware, mindful, and sensitive. Because we can do harm in trying to help if we are not mindful. And so you have people who refuse food because they don't want us to know that they were hungry. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, when we say, oh, this is just extra, you know, we had to do it like that. I'm just, you know, I don't need it. I'm gonna give it away. If you don't want it, okay. Mm -hmm. And then they say, okay, I'll take it. Mm -hmm. But I mean, they do have pride. Mm -hmm. Even though they're yeah. hungry, Absolutely. you know. Yeah. Absolutely. So that is and we all, that we all have that place and the topic may be different but we all have that. And I think if, if we look at it not as an us and them, mm -hmm. and we look at it as a collective and how it impacts our community, then we can truly get to the heart of what we need to do. Yes. Because at any point in time, like I said, it's a spectrum. Mm -hmm. I didn't expect to be in a poverty situation, but I was. And thank goodness I had enough of the other resources to be able to navigate. So what I would encourage this board, as I encourage the school system as well, if it only takes one caring adult to make the change, mm -hmm. we have no excuse. That's my take. So thank you for your time. I hope that I was mindful enough, Absolutely. and I hope that's the information that you all were looking for. Yes. Yes. Thank you.